Hey everybody, welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry and today we'll be having another board game review. Today I'll be reviewing this game right here, Winner's Circle, designed by Reiner Knizia. And this edition here is published by Dice Tree Games. I'm going to set the game up, show you guys a little bit as to how it plays, and then you'll catch me back at the end of the video with my final thoughts and grades. So this is what the game looks like set up for three players. Um, the game does play anywhere from two to six, but for the purpose of this video, I'm doing three player game. You have the blue player, the yellow player, and the red player. Uh, each player gets their uh, color piece to designate who they are. And this is double sided. It has a man on one side and a woman on another. And you have your three betting tokens, two which are numbered one and one that's number two. So it's a double bet. Also, you have these seven horses, which are nice pre-painted miniatures, all with different numbers, corresponding with the different numbered spots in which they will begin the race. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So you put them all on their corresponding starting spot. You shuffle the winner's circle deck of cards, which has tons of cards, and you randomly select seven and place them here on these slots. And each of these slots corresponds with one of the seven different horses. And basically, these are the stats for the horses. And each card shows whatever the horse's name is. For example, this one will be Gray Lag. And it shows the different configurations or sides of the die. And how much they will move if a player chooses to activate this horse based on that die roll, right? So you've got the horse's head here, which Gray Lag would move two if a player chose to activate him. You've got the helmet here, which would be a four. You've got the horse saddle here, which would move Gray Lag up to 12 spaces. And you've got the horseshoe, which would move him up to eight. Very important to understand the six uh, faces of the die. We have each of these symbols takes up one face of the die except for the horse head. Three out of the six faces of the die are the horse head, so that's a 50-50 chance of rolling that symbol. We also have the money in this game, which is all of these different coins, all of these beautiful real metal coins in different denominations from 500 to 100 to 50, right? We set these aside to pay off the players at the end of the race. You could either play this game just one race, or you could do something like two out of three, or even just three races in a row and see who has the most money. So the way the game begins is we are going to start by making bets. So the starting player starts to make, and they you make one bet at a time. And you could play, there is a variant to do hidden betting, but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to do straight up visible betting. So you could place your double bet if you wanted to, or one of your single bets. So I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to place a single bet on number one, right? Number one already has a little bit of the edge because he's a little bit further ahead. And his card has some decent stats. At least two of the faces of the die are going to advance him 12 spots. Everything else is going to make him very, very slow. So that is um, a weakness for him, but... If those other two faces get rolled enough, he should be all right. I'm not going to put my double bet on him, but I'll put my single bet. Now, yellow will go, and yellow's going to say they're going to go for number four. Because number four here, Secretariat, has some very consistent numbers. Everything is pretty close to each other. Nothing's phenomenal. But they're like, hey, this will be a consistent uh, horse. The red player is going to choose, and you can bet on someone else's horse. You do want to have some, ideally you want to have some horses that are all to your own because then you'll you'll get all the profits. It's not that you split the profits. Each player will make their full portion of their profit. But if someone makes the same profit along with you, what good is that to you, right? So number four, uh, player number three is going to go for number uh, six. Number six has a weak side of the die, but the other three faces which is half of the die, are pretty solid numbers. So player number three feels confident about that. Okay, so now player number one, the blue player, is going to go back. And they are going to go over here. Number three is solid, so they'll go with number three. And then the yellow player will bet, and they'll go here. I'm going to speed this up, folks, so I could just show you how the game plays. They'll place their double all by itself over here. And this blue player will place 
his double right here, and the red player will place their double. Uh, number seven is always a little bit risky because it's it's the furthest back. They'll place their double right here. Okay, and now we will proceed with the game. So starting with the starting player, they roll their die, and I rolled a horseshoe, a, a horse head. And based on this, now I can move any horse of my choice that's available, right? Because as the game goes on, you're going to flip these cards face down, and they will be unavailable. So we're going to pick any horse. So the blue player is going to see if any of their horses is benefited by the horse's head here. And this horse here, the Alsab, would only move one. So it would be a terrible decision to move that horse. This guy would move five, which is their second highest. So that's a, a consideration. And finally, top flight would also move one. Another thing you want to consider when you're rolling is how can you hurt your opponents, right? Which horse uh, would be affected by this. So there are some, for example, this horse only moves two for that side of the die. So that would be a great way of hurting them. And that's pretty much it. That's the only horse. So you know what? It's not worth it because that's number seven. So instead, the blue player is going to decide to move Sinsenbai over here, who moves five um, spaces every time you activate him from the horse head die roll. So that is horse number three. We're going to move horse number three right here. Five spaces. We're going to count the five spaces. One, two, three, four, and five, which puts them over here in the numbered spot number three. And because I activated this horse, I will flip this card face down, and nobody else can move that horse until all the other cards have been flipped face down and then refreshed. Okay, so now we'll proceed to the yellow player's turn. They're going to roll the die. And they roll the horseshoe. So again, first thing they might want to look at is which of their horses is benefited by a horseshoe. And Grey Lag here, their second best uh, possibility is that horseshoe. So that might be an option. Secretariat, same thing here. Their second best um, uh, number here is the horseshoe as well. And Discovery would not be a choice because they would only move one, right? They could choose to hurt an opponent's horse. Busher here would only move one with a horseshoe. So that is a possibility. And you know what? The yellow player is going to go with that possibility. They're going to choose to move Busher here. And Busher, because they're activating Busher with the horseshoe, would only be entitled to move one spot. However, since Busher is here and the number one spot ahead is occupied, two horses cannot share a spot. So in essence, what you've done by choosing this card is you basically nullify Busher or no, the horse number two's movement for this turn. We flip the face, the card face down, and we will proceed to the red player's turn. And the red player is furious because their horse, number two, uh, was cheated out of movement this round, right? So they're going to roll their die, and they roll the saddle here. So first and foremost, they're going to look for their horses, two of their horses have already been flipped and used. So they're not going to look into that. So here, right here, just so happens that Al Sab's best face of the die, or the most beneficial to him, is the horse saddle, which moves him up to 12 spaces. So that is horse number six. So we're going to count 12 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All right, and they're already over here. Real important, right here you have this uh, pace token here. The for first horse to cross this spot, and it's always placed in the number 18 spot. You're going to grab this pace token, put it on this horse as a reminder that every person who bet it on their horse is going to gain an additional $100 um, per bet if the horse finishes in the top three. Really important. You only collect money if your horse finishes in the top three spaces. Okay, so we're done with the red player's turn. Let's flip over card number six, horse number six's card. And now we'll proceed with the blue player's turn. And again, they've got the horse head here. They're gonna look at their characters. They don't wanna do this one. This one is no longer available. So they're gonna do something that hurts their opponents. They're gonna choose to move gray lag two spaces, right? But again, the rule is that two horses cannot occupy the same space. So the space ahead of number seven is available. But the second space ahead, 
which they would have been entitled to thanks to their card. It's not available. It is occupied right now by horse number five. So horse number seven only moves up one space. Okay, so now we'll move on to the yellow players next turn. And we got another horse head. And they're going to look at their cards. And right now, they're going to do this one right here, top flight, which is the blue player put the bet on this one. And it would only move one, right? So that's an amazing way of hurting your opponents. Okay, so we're done with the yellow player's turn. We'll proceed to the red player. They roll, and again, they got the horse's head. And then they have to choose between these two. And both of these are their opponents. And both of these would advance four spaces. So the first thing they want to look at is um, which one would be the most affected by the fact that they could only move four spaces. Um, so horse number four. Um, oh, I moved horse number four. I was supposed to move horse number three. I made a big mistake. Sorry about that, guys. One, two, three, four, five. So this is where horse number three is. Okay. Um, so horse number four and horse number five are the two choices here. Um, so horse number four can radically roll higher, potentially. They can move all the way up to 10. So this is the one that would probably be more hurt by that move. So we will choose horse number five, I should say, and they will move four spaces. So here's horse number five. Four spaces is one uh two and three and four so that space is occupied is unoccupied so they would be able to move all the way up here okay so there is that and now finally the blue player will go again and they have no choice as to which horse they will move because only one of these horses is available so and they roll the horse head so they have to move horse number four secretariat here up four spaces so one two three four all of these spots are occupied so the furthest ahead that horse number four could move is only one spot so it was detrimental to them and yes so this is pretty much it folks this game we keep on uh rolling the dice choosing the um horses once all seven of them have been flipped face down you refresh all seven of them, flipping them back face up. And now they're all available choices, right? So there is this flow through the game of having lots of choices, having a few choices, and then ultimately having no choice. And then you kind of cycle through that experience. Now, the first three horses to cross the race will be placed in the first, second, and third slot. And players will collect their payoffs which is all based on the place that their horse finished in plus how many bets were placed on that horse. The less bets or the fewer bets that were placed on a horse, the more it's going to pay out, right? The more bets that were placed on a horse, the, the less it's going to pay off because uh, the idea is that the underdog gets you a bigger uh, payout because of the fact that the odds were against him and that's pretty much the way the game works again the pace horse whoever has the token if they finish in the top three will get, collect an additional hundred dollars for each of the persons who bet there for each individual bet and you tally up the money at the end of the game and whoever has the most money it doesn't matter if they're if just because your horse is first place doesn't necessarily mean you win whoever has the most money as a combination of all their horses at the end of the game is the winner. And again, if you want to, you can choose to play best two out of three or play three games in a row and see who has the most, most money. And there are a bunch of other variants included in the, in the game. You have some secret bidding. You even have a Royal Turf uh, deck of cards for a Royal Turf variant, which is actually the original game of which this winner's circle is based on. All right, so let's get back to hear my final thoughts and grades. And that's how you play Winner's Circle. Fun little game, race theme game, horse theme game, horse betting game, right? If that's the kind of thing you like, this is a pretty neat game for that. Now, let's get straight to my grades. First of all, uh, let's start with components. I'm going to give this an A plus for components. Uh, the components in this game are phenomenal. I mean, the 
um, metal coins. They're beautiful. They're, they're, they feel so valuable, right? And the horses, the miniature horses with that are pre-painted, they're gorgeous. They're absolutely beautiful. Nice detail. Just really gets you into that feel of the game. And again, the metal coins just make you feel so satisfied when you actually successfully gain some money. So the cars are of solid quality. The board looks really nice. So yeah, I'm going to give this game an A plus as far as components are concerned. Now let's move on to theme. And for theme, I'm going to give it an A minus because yes, mechanically speaking, you're just rolling dice as your typical most racing games have some sort of dice rolling. And you know, there are some other things that you're like, well, how does that tie in thematically? But as you play the game, the feeling that it evokes is really thematic. You really feel like you're cheering for your horse, right? And even on other players' turns, you're hoping for something to happen, of course, from the roll of the die that might turn the race around for one of your horses, right? Or might hinder or slow down one of your opponent's horses and usually the end game in this game is very tight where there's usually like four or five horses that are really in contention for that first place spot um we played a game not too long ago where i think all seven horses by the end of the game like that final stretch all had at least an outside chance of being first place. And that is very, very interesting. You know, that doesn't happen all the time. But again, it always feels like there's a good amount of horses, five or six horses that really have a legitimate chance. And that makes it for such a nail-biting, exciting experience, which again, makes you feel like that. And even just your wagering and all that really makes you feel like you're betting on a real horse. Again, thematically speaking, I'm going to give this an A-. minus. Uh, now let's talk about gameplay. For gameplay, I'm gonna give it a B plus. And the only reason I'm the only reason I'm giving it that low of a grade is because it is a very simplistic game, um, very basic. Uh, but I do like how it plays. You know, I'm, I I I do want to give it that. You know, and uh, and for what it is, a racing game, and if you play it as a filler, because one race really plays out pretty quickly. The rule book does suggest or recommend that you play something like two out of best two out of three or three races and whoever has the most money after three races, things along those lines. And at that point, it doesn't feel like a filler anymore. Very rarely have I ever gone down that path. I usually do just play it as a one and done filler and just pack it up and put it away. Um, and as a filler, it gets the job done. It's really solid. I don't want to overhype it and make people think that they're getting something more complex or more meaty or more crunchy. But again, for what it is, it gets the job done. So I'm going to give it a solid B plus for uh, gameplay. Then let's talk about novelty factor. For novelty factor, I'm going to give it an A minus. This game feels different than some of the other race theme games out there. And I love the idea that after you roll a die you get to pick um, one of the horses to advance, right? And it may or not, may be your horse, it may be one of your opponent's horse based on the factors of, is this move more helpful to my horse or more hurtful to my opponent's horse, right? And that ratio will lead you into your decision as to which horse you will decide. But as the you know, turns progress, you don't always have all seven horses available to you to select from, right? So that in, even uh, in and of itself definitely adds an interesting dynamic to the game where sometimes you will be forced to advance one of your opponent's horses because you only have a limited amount of options. And if you use that die roll that you just rolled for one of your horses, it would be drastically detrimental to you. So why not just, you know, help your opponent and hold out on the hope that you can still really help your horse or someone else can with a future role. So it's all about that. And then sometimes, you know, there's always the seventh horse that's available. And if it's your opponent's horse, you're so frustrated when you roll a die that is a die roll that's actually, you know, helpful for them. 
But what else can you do? At that point, you have no choice, right? So it's really cool. The, you know, um, cadence of the game or the cadence of the rounds as you start with certain you know, points in the game where you have lots of choices to pick from. And then later on, you have fewer choices, sometimes no choices, and then it restarts, right? That part is really, really cool. Um, so yeah, all those aspects, I'm going to say that it gives it a different feel than most of the other race theme games that I play in, where yes, you can sometimes, like a game in Downforce, you can af affect your opponents, but it's not quite the same, right? You pick one horse in this in this game, turn per turn and you choose either to you know help one of your horses or again hurt one of your opponent's horses so yeah it gets an a minus for novelty factor and then finally my overall grade i'm gonna give it a solid a minus this is a good game folks um again you've got to factor in what it is it's not a heavy game i would say it's not even a medium game i'd say this is a light game this is a gateway game i really think so i think this game can be introduced to non-gamers, casual gamers. It can be introduced to um, children even, right? It's that simplistic as far as the rules are concerned, but it does have some strategy to it, right? So while non-gamers and uh, children can play, they may or may not necessarily win their first couple games because, again, there's some fine nuances to the game design that create some really interesting uh, decision-making opportunities. So that's a great combination for me. When you have a light game that still feels very strategic and, um, you know, um, tactically rich as this game does, then that for me is always a thumbs up, a plus. So yeah, I'm going to give it an overall grade of A-. And that's it, folks, for my grades and my review of Winner's Circle. If you like racing games, if you like horse racing games, if you like games with beautiful components, you might want to check this game out. It is published by Dice Tree Games. Uh, I was able to gain a copy straight from the Dice Tree publishing company's website online i think they're based out in korea and i believe it's still in print but don't quote me on that well that's it for today folks thank you for joining us here at when harry met board games comment down below tell me what you think about this game perhaps you've played it before perhaps you've played it in some of its other iterations like royal turf well take care everybody this is harry from when harry met board games saying take care stay safe stay healthy and have fun gaming bye-bye